I will be talking to you today about executive stress. Um, I've only got 15 minutes, so there's not exactly a lot I can do in giving you an effective management toolkit. I'm going to give you one effective tool. Mainly, I'm just going to dangle a big juicy carrot in front of you. Uh, whether you bite that carrot or not is completely up to you. So on the agenda for the next 15 minutes is just a very quick overview of what executive stress actually is. Uh, what it represents, how it manifests, um, and how you can manage it. I'm sure you know about sleep, healthy eating, exercise, meditation. I'm sure you all do those things because you've got plenty of time in which to do them, haven't you? Um, but that's only part of the puzzle. There's also effective resilience, mental techniques that you'll need to deal with a challenging situation because I'm sure you'll all agree things have been very, very challenging. Uh, they're always challenging. They've been extra challenging for the past two years. Um, so I'm going to talk uh, about a technique known as Rational Emotive Behaviour Therapy, or REBT. Um, you'll find out with it that it's all about belief systems. It's all about attitudes, and it's got a model, a structure, that's as easy as ABC to execute and to help you in the face of difficulties. One of the biggest things that you face in actually approaching things like this is stigma. Worry about what people will think if you are the sort of person that needs something like this and someone like me. So really, at the end of the day, it helps if you think of it not as therapy, but as something else. And I'll be talking about what those something else actually are. So executive stress, what is it? Well, for a start, it's an actual thing. It's recognized by the American Psychiatric Association. So it has an entry into their dictionary of psychology. Um, and it's not that your stress is extra special stress. It doesn't mean that you've earned your stress more than anybody else as you've climbed the ladder. It just recognizes that there are stresses that are particular to your management level, to what you do. Stresses that probably only you realize that nobody else even considers. And these stresses existed prior to 2019. But since 2019, those stresses have increased exponentially. Hospitality withered on the vine overnight, and you suddenly had to think about major challenges and major decisions on the fly without information. Big decisions, constantly, daily, you're adjusting and micro-adjusting. Who to furlough, how to furlough, when to furlough, who to let go, who to bring back, who to keep dangling, who to entice. How do you keep everything going? Will you survive? How will you survive? That's a lot to put on one set of shoulders. It's still going on now. You've got supply chain issues, you've got staffing issues, you've got all sorts of issues, and it's still a lot on your shoulders, a particular set of problems on a particular set of shoulders. And we have idioms in the English language that, that cover this very, very nicely. First one is the title of this presentation. It's tough at the top. That used to be said tongue in cheek. They always fly executive class. I know, it's tough at the top. But now it actually means it's tough at the top. It's also lonely at the top. Who do you turn to? Because the buck does stop with you. Everybody else in your organization has a support structure. Everybody else in your organization has a line manager. Who do you have? Are you part of a WhatsApp group, the bunch of stressed out executives sharing the burden? Or is the burden yours and yours alone? Who do you turn to? Do you even turn to? How do you manage your stress? because stress does manifest. First of all, we actually have good stress. It's known as eustress. Perhaps you thrive on the challenge, even the COVID challenges. You'll thrive, you're excited, it gets you out of bed, it drives you. This is good stress, eustress. But if the stresses and strains of your role are exceeding your ability to cope, then eustress, good stress, becomes bad stress. It becomes distress. And it's manifest as anxiety as depression, as anger management issues. You can have IBS, irritable bowel syndrome, that's normally a stress-related condition. Psoriasis and other skin conditions, they're usually stress-related. Insomnia is often stress-related. We've got burnout syndrome, that's an occupational phenomena. You're not immune to it. You can develop unhealthy coping strategies, drugs, prescription or recreational, alcohol, junk food even. There's absenteeism. I'm sure you're all well aware of the cost of absenteeism, staff sickness, loss to stress. But presenteeism is one and a half times more costly to any business than absenteeism. So first in, last out, always on, less productive, more prone to stress. And yet your role kind of demands that you are 
always on. So what are you doing about it? Apart from sleep, apart from meditation, apart from healthy eating, apart from exercise. Well, there is this thing, and it's called rational emotive behavior therapy. It's a, a form of CBT, cognitive behavior therapy, except um, it's a little bit more. So it's a form of psychotherapy, so it can work on specific emotional and behavioral issues. It's also a coaching tool, so it's used in life coaching and it's used in business coaching. But it's also considered to be a school of thought in and of itself, so it's just a great way of looking at life in a much more calm, much more rational, and much more productive manner. And it has an ethos, it has a philosophy to it. Um, this particular quote, um, according to Google, was said by Captain Jack Sparrow in Pirates of the Caribbean 1, The Curse of the Black Pearl, except he never said it. He never said it in any of the movies, he never said it at all, but all over the world, Google says he did but it neatly encaptures what REBT says is going on. So it's not the events in life that disturb you, it's what you're telling yourself about those events that does the disturbing. So if you're stuck, if you're stressed, unhealthily stressed, if you're thinking and feeling and acting in ways that you don't like, but don't seem to be able to change, it's not the thing, it's your interpretation of it. And the idea is if you change your interpretation, you will naturally change how you think, how you feel, how you act. Now, we're not saying that when stuff happens, it doesn't have an influence. It does. Life is always challenging. Life is always difficult. Life will always throw you really rotten curveballs. But even in the face of the negative, even in the face of the challenging, even in the face of all those curveballs, you can still remain in control or regain that sense of control if you think you've lost it by looking at what it is that you're telling yourself. So this means nothing and no one can make you anxious. Nothing and no one can make you depressed. Nothing and no one can make you angry. Nothing and no one can drive you to drink, to drugs, to distraction, or donuts. It's your interpretation. Unconscious, but it's your interpretation. Change the interpretation, change the outcome. Here's an interpretation. Let's say I run my own company. The buck does stop with me. And unconsciously, I've developed this attitude. So it is, it's all down to me. I absolutely have to keep everything together. I must, I must, I must. It's gonna be awful, it's gonna be catastrophic if I don't. It's gonna be intolerable if I don't. And if I don't, it's all my fault. I'm weak, I'm a failure, I'm ineffectual. Well, I hope you can understand that that is not a very helpful attitude to hold. That's not gonna mitigate my stress. That's not gonna help me problem solve. It's gonna increase the stress. We're looking at insomnia, we're looking at all those stress-related symptoms I was talking about. I become less productive with that as a belief system. I probably even suffer from that little thing that quite a lot of people get when they get to the top, imposter syndrome. I don't know how I got here, I don't know what I'm doing, someone's gonna find out, help. What about this as a belief system? So, same CEO, same company, same buck stopping with me. But this time, unconscious my attitude is this. Okay, I hope I can keep it all together. I don't have to, not always. I'm not gonna like it if I can't, but it's not the end of the world. It's not a catastrophe. It might be difficult for me to deal with, challenging even if I can't, but I know I can get through it. I can stand it, I always do. I'm not a failure, I'm not weak, I'm not ineffectual. Even when there are times when I can't keep it all together, I am a worthwhile, fallible human being doing my best doing my best at the moment in unprecedented times. Well, hopefully you can understand that if that's my mindset, I am gonna be calmer. There's still stress, but stress that I'm in control of. Any decisions that I make then are gonna be calmer and more rational and more constructive. So REBT then is the art of taking somebody who thinks like the former and helping them think like the latter. And we do it with this. And this, I hope, for incredibly obvious reasons, is known as the ABCDE model of psychological health. A stands for the activating event or the adversity. And there are plenty of adversities in hospitality at the moment. C stands for the consequence. Consequences are your reactions. So they're your thoughts, they're your feelings, they're your behaviors, they're your emotions, they're your decisions, good, bad, indifferent, and otherwise. Now, the adversity, is an influence over the way you think, the way you feel, and the way you act. But it is only an influence. More directly, it triggers a belief system. And it's the belief system that drives the reaction. 
So if you're telling yourself you must keep it all together, it's going to be a nightmare if you don't. The consequence is unhealthy stress, bad decisions, poor sleep, IBS, insomnia, etc. But if you're telling yourself, okay, I like to, I hope to, but I don't have to keep it all together, I won't like it, but it's not going to be the end of the world, healthier stress, better decisions, better coping strategies. So we identify the unhealthy beliefs that are causing the stress. We formulate healthy versions, rational equivalents, and then both sets of beliefs in place, we move on to the D. D stands for disputing. Um, disputing is just a posh word for challenging. We challenge your beliefs over and over again. We weaken the unhealthy ones. We strengthen the healthy ones. Little by little, we're affecting a shift from one way of thinking to the other. And when you can feel that shift take place, we know we've arrived at E. E means I have an effective, rational outlook on that original adversity. So the challenge is still there, the predicament is still there, but you've changed the way you think about it, so you've changed the way that you deal with it. Doesn't mean the end of the work on the problem. Once you've got that effective, rational outlook, you've got to commit to acting in accordance with it as often as possible to the best of your ability in any and all challenging situations. So that at some point in the future, you can accept, yep, this rational me, this calmer me, this less stressed me, that's my automatic reaction now. Disputing takes the form of many exercises. The first one is just called disputing, hence the D. And it's actually used everywhere. Um, positive psychology uses a form of disputing. Resilience training in the US Army uses a form of disputing. And this is a, an exercise taken from US Army training. So they train soldiers to be disputational soldiers on the battlefield in challenging situations so they remain more resilient, um, less prone to death or dysfunction. So let's say, um, I mean, there's no Q&A today. I'll be out there uh, in the coffee break if you've got any questions. And let's say I suddenly think, oh, my God, what if someone asks me a question and I can't answer it? I'm going to feel so stupid. I'm going to look so stupid. Well, that's an unhelpful thought that's probably going to make me feel pretty anxious. But I can challenge it immediately, go, hang on a minute, that's not true. Just because I can't answer a question, it doesn't make me stupid. I actually know loads. It's just a question. Well, that, help, um, help, that disputation will help me formulate a more healthy thought. You know what? I've done loads of things like this. I haven't been blindsided yet. I'll get through it. That thought will calm me down. That thought will help me to strategize. If X, then Y. So if somebody does ask me a question and I can't answer it, I'll take down their details and I'll promise to get back to them with an answer. So that anxiety-provoking thought, oh dear God, what if this happens, becomes a strategy with a solution. And this is a technique, as I said, it's used in resilience training for any resilience training program, including the US Army. The main thing that prevents people from accessing people like me is the stigma. I don't have a mental health attitude. I don't need to see a therapist. I don't have any problems. Not any I'm willing to admit to anyway, and I'm, dear God, not letting anyone find out I've got them. Well, we all have weaknesses. We all have problems. In business, we know what to do with a problem. We come up with a solution. We strategize. We don't hide it. We don't bury it. We don't resolve never to talk about it and pretend it's not happening. We bring it out into the light of day, and we discuss solutions. Well, people like me help you affect those solutions. Um, don't think of me as a therapist. Don't think of people like me even as a coach. Um, if you are into fitness, you've probably got a personal trainer, somebody that comes up with a program for you, somebody that adjusts the program to help optimize your body. You will go to them for nutritional advice. There's no stigma attached to that. You're just seeking out a professional that's got knowledge that you haven't. Well, I'm just a personal trainer for the mind. And if you don't like fitness, think about cars. We all know how to keep a car running. We know how to keep a car functioning optimally. We know how to increase the longevity of that vehicle. It takes weekly checks. It takes monthly checks. It takes regular servicing. And the MOT every year. These are sensible things. Well, you've probably never had weekly checks or monthly checks. You've probably never had a service. I doubt you've had an MOT, but it does look like your big end is going. I'm just a mechanic for your mind. That's all people like us do. All these things, they're just very, very solution-focused. There's a problem, something that needs a solution. 
All we do is look at where you are and where you want to be and give you the toolkit to help you get there. And somebody who works in executive stress just understands possibly a little better the stresses and the strains that are particular to your role, the things that are sitting on your shoulders. So that's my 15 minutes. That's my big juicy carrot. I hope that was helpful. Thank you. Thank you.